Hi guys, welcome to a new video and today we're going to talk about ignorance uh, because I felt a heavy urge in my spirit to talk about this because the last week I've been blowing trumpets over and over and over and over and over and over and over again and people were started to ask me questions about more clarity, <laughs> about more for more contacts and all that kind of stuff. I will give you the clarity, I will give you more explanation regarding this. The reason why I was blowing trumpets on certain topics is because I don't want you to be caught unaware because ignorance can cost your salvation. The Bible says they were darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance in them. Okay, it's because of the hardness in their hearts. So ignorance is extremely dangerous. And I want to show you in this video how millions and millions of Christians entered into a pattern of disobedience because of their ignorance. And in this video, I'm going to use two topics as an example to show you how dangerous ignorance is. And I think in this hour, these two topics are valid and extremely important. So let's start. You will be able to see my PowerPoint. And as you can see, we are going to discuss the hidden books and the lost sheep. The reason why I chose these two topics is because these two topics are connected to one another. There were people that called me a satanic, evil, wicked, false woman or false teacher because I've been mentioning the Apocrypha. They say that the hidden books are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. And they say that we need to stick to our 66 Protestant Bible. And they will say, you need to read your Bible again, because if you read your Bible, you will see that those hidden books are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. So it's like, okay, then we're going to read the Bible and we're going to see what the Bible says. Joshua chapter 10, verse 13. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Yasher? When I look into my 66 Protestant Bible, I don't see a book of Yasher. Next verse. Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, what he did in the Red Sea and in the brooks of Arnon. First King chapter 40 verse 19. And the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. Second Chronicles chapter 16 verse 11. Note that the acts of Asa first and last are indeed written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So I've been reading my 66 Protestant Bible and I see that my Bible is referring to other books that I cannot find in my Bible. In fact, there are at least 76 references to other books outside the canon. Now the Apocrypha has also some references, but let's just stick to the 66 Protestant Bible. There are at least 76 references to other books outside the canon. And this is the list. These books are literally being mentioned, being quoted, being cited, being referred to. These books, where are these books? So these people that are saying that we need to read our Bible again, because then we will see that these books are not, I don't know, inspired by the Holy Spirit. When you say that, that only shows that you didn't even read your Bible. Because if you actually did read your Bible, you would know this. So my question to you is, is God now a liar? Or did we inherit lies of our fathers? A lot of people will say that the King James Bible is the most reliable Bible that we can use. And some only rely on the King James Bible. So for those that are convinced that the hidden books are not inspired by the Holy Spirit and that are convinced that the King James Bible is the only reliable Bible that we have. Why are you denying the fact that even the King James Bible contains the Apocrypha? It's the 6011 edition. It's the first edition that was being published. And I have them right here. I have them right here. And as you can see, it contains the Apocrypha. Did you know that? 
Then we have the Geneva Bible, the 1560 edition, not the 1599, the 5060 edition. I have them here. I love this Bible. I love this Bible. This Bible is even older than the King James Bible, and it contains the Apocrypha too. And this Bible was the first English Bible to be fully translated from the original languages. And the Geneva Bible was a product of some of the finest biblical scholars of its day. And in 67, uh, it went to America. But this Bible has a very wild history. And the reason why I bought this Bible is because the King James Bible wanted to ban the Geneva Bible because the authority of the King James Bible came under threat. Now, you need to ask yourself the question now, why? And I bought this one together with the 1611 edition of King James to compare those scriptures. You know, always use multiple Bibles to compare the scriptures. Never rely on only one Bible. But this Bible has a very wild history. I'm going to tell you why. Because in the 6th century, the Roman Catholic Church, which is the Harlot Church of Babylon, okay, they developed their authority and they were very powerful. And they persecuted, they persecuted the saints of the Most High in the most brutal way. If you think that biblical prophecy about the end times will only happen in our lifetime, it's very naive to think like that because we have a history of thousand years behind us. Revelation 12 is talking about the two witnesses being persecuted for a thousand and two hundred and sixty days. And the Roman Catholic Church persecuted God's people for exactly a thousand and two hundred and sixty days years because the two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands okay we have two olive trees we have the natural olive tree the natural branches which are the shoes i'm going to call them shoes in this video and the wild olive tree the wild branches which are the gentiles these are the two witnesses and during these dark ages the Roman Catholic Church persecuted God's people and these early Protestants they realized that the papacy was the antichrist because the antichrist is not a, a one-man antichrist an antichrist is a spirit someone who denies christ has an antichrist spirit and that spirit of the antichrist is operating in people in rulers in governments in organizations okay that's why the bible's talking about beasts four beasts ten horns which are ten kingdoms okay who are the most the 10 most powerful countries in this world. So the spirit of Antichrist is operating in many forms. And the papacy is one of them. And the papacy is still ruling till this day. Okay, the Roman Catholic Church is still ruling till this day. And um, these early Protestants, they are, were literally risking their lives for writing this Bible again because the Roman Catholic Church was burning up manuscripts. And these early Protestants, they were literally being killed for writing this Bible and that's why I wanted to have it but even this Bible contains the Apocrypha. One funny fact is that King James was a homosexual. I didn't know this. <laughs> I just figured this out like a couple days ago but yeah King James he was a he was a homosexual. Uh, he enjoyed the company of handsome young men and sometimes shared his bed with his favorites and was often passionate in his expressions of love for them. So there's evidence that King James had relationships, sexual relationships with these men. So the reason why I do not rely fully on the King James Bible is because weird things were going on around this guy. And I always use multiple Bibles. Um, I also use my Christian Standard Bible um, and the Sefer Bible because the Sefer Bible corrected many errors. They put back the name of our God in the scriptures and... Um, they are based on the Hebrew manuscripts, so, and they contain like literally all the books, like all the hidden books. So that's why I also use the Sefer Bible together with the King James, the Geneva, and other, other books. So this is something to keep in mind, okay? So does this mean that our Bibles are not reliable? Does it mean that we need to throw away our Bibles? No. Not any Bible is perfect, but you need to know something. There is a certain agenda that they are trying to push through your Bible. And they did this with every single Bible, except for the Sefer Bible and the Hallelujah Scriptures, because I didn't see that in those two Bibles. But in the rest of the Bibles, they have been pushing the same one agenda. And I'm going to show you what that is. And I'm going to show you how you can see if your Bible is being altered.
For the ones that are using the NIV Bible, just check up if your Bible contains the book of Obadiah. It's in the Old Testament. It's a small book. If it doesn't contain that book, you need to buy a new one because that book is extremely, extremely important for the latter days. Um, because I know that the NIV Bible for the women's study, it doesn't contain that, that book. So that's very weird. So check that up. But now I'm going to show you how you can recognize if your Bible is being altered and if your Bible is pushing that agenda. I'm going to take you to the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments, which is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath, okay, that's on Saturday. And when you read Genesis, that is the only day that is being declared as holy. The only day that is holy in God's eyes. And the righteous receive that promised rest of the Sabbath. And we need to obey that. And I'm going to take you to Hebrew chapter 4. Read with me. Therefore, since the promise to enter his rest remains, let us beware that none of you be found to have fallen short. For we also have received the good news just as they did, but the message they heard did not benefit them, since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. For we who have believed enter the rest in keeping with what he has said. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in this way. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. Again, in that passage, he says, they will never enter my rest. Now keep reading. Listen. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news did not enter because of disobedience. He again specifies a certain day, today. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. Therefore, a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. For the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works, just as God did from his. Let us then make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. Listen what it says. There were people among us, the believers, that received the good news, but they didn't enter the promised rest because of disobedience. And Paul was warning us that we should make every single effort to enter that rest so that we do not fall into that same pattern of disobedience. Do you understand what this passage is talking about? People will say, oh, you're, ke you're keeping the Sabbath. That, that, that's, that's when you're under the law. No. Jesus said, when, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And keeping the Sabbath, that was a commandment of God. It's in the first 10 commandments. It's a blessing from God to enter that rest. And people didn't enter that rest because of their disobedience. Now, let me tell you something. Millions, maybe even billions of Christians throughout generations fell into this pattern of disobedience because they were ignorant about keeping the Sabbath. And I'm going to show you why is it so dangerous to be, to, to be ignorant about this and why Paul has warned us about this and why God wanted us to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now I'm going to take you to Nimrod because Nimrod was the man that created Babylon. He was the one that created all those pagan holidays that Christians are celebrating till this day. Um, and the influence of Nimrod, okay, from Babylon is operating till this day. And I'm going to use one example, one holiday that Christians are celebrating that is directly linked to the satanic agenda that they're trying to push through your Bible. And that is Easter. Now keep those red eggs in your mind. Easter was originally the celebration of Ishtar the Assyrian and Babylonian goddess of fertility and sex, and her symbols were eggs and bunnies. Now ask yourself the question if you're celebrating Easter, what does eggs and bunnies has to do with Christ? 
Where in the Bible does it say that we need to celebrate those things like Christmas and Easter and all those holidays? Because every single time when God gave us a holy feast, he gave us the exact date and he gave us the exact instructions and traditions how to celebrate and prepare the feast. The reason why this celebration is using eggs and bunnies because the celebration has two parts. You have the impregnation part where the bunny is searching for the eggs and then you have the sacrifice part. The sacrifice part is the part where babies from the previous year were killed and sacrificed to the goddess. And those gathered eggs were being dipped into the blood of the sacrificed children and sent home for fertility blessings. Because this celebration is actually celebrating fertility and sex. These holidays were Christianized and they did this on Sunday. Now within Christianity, when Christians are celebrating Easter, what are you celebrating? The Sunday resurrection of Christ. And the reason why you're celebrating that, why every single church is participating in this, is because of this verse, Mark 16, verse 2. It says, and very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. The first day of the week, that is Sunday, right? That is why you're celebrating the, the Sunday resurrection, because everyone believes that Jesus Christ rose up on a Sunday, because the Bible says the first day of the week. Now, for the people that are watching me for a longer time, I always say to you, go back to the original manuscripts. Always translate the passages. Now, we're going to translate the part of the week, which means Sabbaton. And Sabbaton means Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath is on a Saturday. It's not the first day of the week. So what we see here is they have intentionally mistranslated this Bible first to push a Sunday worship agenda. The correct translation of this verse is, and when the Sabbath passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they could go and anoint him. Very early in the morning of that one Sabbath, that's the Sabbath that is referring to first one, they came to make a memorial at the rising of the sun. All these things were happening at the same day on the Sabbath because God is holy. So he will rise up on a holy day. Which day was holy in God's eyes? It was the Sabbath. It was Saturday. But your Bible is saying that on the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, were buying spices. And then the next day on a Sunday early in the morning, then they made a memorial at the rising of the sun. But that's not true. All of these things happened on the Sabbath. But they are pushing this Sunday worship agenda. And do you see now how millions or billions of Christians throughout generations have entered this pattern of disobedience because of their ignorance? Because if you actually kept the Sabbath, you would actually know that this whole Sunday resurrection doesn't make any sense. There is a reason why God said, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy because he knew what the world would do. He knew what Satan would do. And do you see now the impact when you are changing one little part of a verse? Now imagine if you remove books out of the Bible, what kind of impact it can have. The Ethiopian Bible is the oldest and most complete Bible on earth. And it's nearly 800 years older than the King James Bible. And it contains probably over 100 books. Hence the number 66 Protestant Bible. Listen, six months ago, six months ago, I also was convinced that the Bible only exists of 66 books. Look what God revealed to me in just a couple of months. Now you have a choice. You have a choice to continue in this pattern of disobedience 
And to stay ignorant or to actually take this to God and to repent. You have a choice. Now, does this mean that God was not able to protect his word? He did protect his word. His hidden books are not destroyed, but they are hidden. And there is a reason why God allowed these books to be hidden. And that is directly connected to the lost sheep. Now I want you to keep this passage in your mind. Okay, it says, Keep not thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For look, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off, from being a nation that the name of, I'm not going to say that loud, may be no more in remembrance. Everything that is happening on this planet, all the lies, all the deceptions, all the wars is because of this. Because Satan is fighting against the seed of Jacob, against the offspring of the woman in the wilderness, especially when it comes to the natural branches. Because we have the natural branches, the shoes, by bloodline. And then we have the Gentiles that we are crafted in. But God is not done yet with the shoes. And those crafty people, okay, their plans, what they are doing against the seed of Jacob is being described in the book of Enoch. That is why they don't want to read that book because that book exposes everything. Now for us to know where these people are hidden, and where do they come from? We need to look into the scriptures. So I'm going to show you some scriptures. We start with Deuteronomy 28, verse 63 to 68. It says, Then the Lord will scatter you among all nations, from one end of the earth to the other. The Lord will send you back in ships to Egypt on a journey I said you should never make again. There you will offer yourself for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. Therefore, says the Lord, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered and I will give you the land of the next verse. And I will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered. Next verse, out of the nations where they have gone. So we see here that those people were being scattered across the whole world. In that day, remember this, in that day, which day will come we will come back later on that. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time, second Exodus, to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the Mediterranean. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of him. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. And look what it says. In that day, the Lord will regather them. What is that day? The Lord declares, when I will bring my people <laughs> and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it and until he have performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you shall consider it. That's why I'm talking about this topic, because in the latter days, we shall consider this. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortress of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage you know who because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land and have cast lots for my people and have traded a boy for a prostitute and have sold a girl for wine and have drunk it therefore thus said the lord god surely in the fire of my jealousy have i spoken against all edom which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their heart keep that verse in mind the book of Sophania is a very important book because it says, At that time, I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather the scattered. I will make those who were disgraced throughout the earth receive praise and fame. 
At that time, I will bring you back. Yes, at the time, I will gather you. I will make you famous and praiseworthy among all the peoples of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, Yahweh has spoken. The book of Sephania is talking about one day in which all these things are going to happen. And that day is referring to the great day of the Lord, which is the second coming of Christ. And God's people are being gathered and they're going to possess their land again. That will happen when the Messiah returns because the Messiah is the king of his people and all the glory will go to him. Now ask yourself the questions. Does this match with the modern land of you know who? I'm not going to pronounce it because I don't know in how far YouTube can filter that out. Think about this. Did we see the Messiah return in 1948, look at these verses. Second Baruch, this Apocrypha. Now hear also about the bright waters which come at the end after the black ones. This is the word. After the signs have come of which I have spoken to you before, when the nations are moved and the time of my anointed one comes. So when the time of his anointed one comes, the time of the Messiah, he will call all nations and some of them he will spare and others he will kill. These things will befall the nations which will be spared by him. Every nation which has not known you know who and which has not trodden down the seed of Jacob will live. And this is because some from all the nations have been subjected to your people. All those now who have ruled over you or have known you will be delivered up to the sword. This is the Apocrypha. And look, it is very similar to this verse in the book of Luke. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Do you see the connection between these two verses? Now, how are you going to tell me that these books are not inspired by the Holy Spirit? There is a reason why they didn't want you to read these books. There is a reason why God allowed these books to be hidden because his people are hidden. And his people needed to be hidden until the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Because of the sufferings of the natural branches, the Gentiles were able to be grafted into the Messiah. For this part, I would recommend you to read 2nd Ezra chapter 1, verse 33 to 40. So if you know who the shoes by bloodline are going to possess their land and will be regathered when Christ is coming, then who are these people in the modern land? Because many think that the establishment of you know who in 1948 was that promise in the Bible. And they will refer it to the new covenant, which is being described in the book of Jeremiah. But that new covenant is the covenant of Christ. We have the old covenant and the new covenant. So I don't know how people will come with that argument. But that establishment in 1948 is not the establishment that is being described in the Bible. This is a counterfeit. You need to understand that God has a timeline and Satan has a timeline. And Satan likes to imitate God. He likes to deceive people. He likes to deceive people so much that he will even create a false holy land. Did you ever hear about the Balfour, hence Baal, declaration in 1917? Dear Lord Rothschild, people that don't know who is Rothschild, I would not recommend you to dig into that rabbit hole because you don't want to. You, you don't want to know that. You don't want to know what they are doing behind the scenes. Don't dig into that rabbit hole. Just know that these people are Satanists and they own everything in this world. They own all the banks. They own everything. This is a letter to Rothschild. And look what it says. I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of his majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish aspirations which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His majesty's government view would favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. 
Read that again. Do you understand what they're saying here? Do you understand this? This is the verse that immediately came up in my mind. Therefore, thus said the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against all Edom, which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their hearts. These people in the modern land are not shoes by bloodline. They are not the lost sheep. They are Kazarians. Originally, they come from Kazaria. I made a video about this. I'm not going to dig into this, but I will offer you that video in the comment section because that video is private. So only the people that have the link can watch that video. But I will publish that link in the comment section so you can watch that video. And then you will understand what I'm talking about. So this is a map of Palestina in 1873 and all the Bible lands. And now you can see to whom the land belongs. It belongs to the Palestinians. But with the Balfour Declaration, they just give that land to Rothschild. And they possess the land without any rights. With, actually, without any rights. They just, they just stole the land. These people are the descendants of Edom. They are Edomites. The Bible's talking about them. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 9 and Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, it says, I know your tribulation and poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say that they are shoes and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Take note, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be shoes and are not, but are lying. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. And somehow believers are ignoring this verse completely. Those people in the modern land are Edomites. These rulers in the modern land is the synagogue of Satan. Do you not also understand why they are bombarding that little small part out there? I'm not going to call it out loud. Do you understand why that is happening? Do you see how deep the deception is going? And do you see now how millions of Christians came into agreement with Satan spiritually because they supported the bloodshed of what these people were doing. They have killed 10 thousands of people. And Christians are supporting that. And do you see now how Satan led you into this pattern of disobedience, this pattern of ignorance, and you created this spiritual agreement with Satan because you're supporting that. You are supporting the synagogue of Satan. Let it sink in. Now, when you're at school, they're going to teach you about the Middle East. On the news, they talk about the Middle East. But the Middle East was developed after World War I. Before that time, there was no Middle East. They just changed those borders and they just made it look like that that part is separated from a certain continent. And now I'm going to show you which continent that is. This is a picture. And we see here the African plate and the Arabian plate. And as you can see, the modern land belongs to Africa. It's Northeast Africa. That's that light brownish part. Another picture, the dark brownish part, you can see the modern land belongs to Africa. It is for religious and geographical political reasons that the modern land is not publicly acknowledged as being on the northeast region of the African continent. Now again, ask yourself why? Why would they hide this? So for all these people that are saying, this doesn't matter, why are you talking about this? Then why are they lying to us about this? Because once you link the Middle East with Africa, you will have to face the facts of our misunderstandings of history. You need to rewrite everything. And that information will come out soon. It's coming out. Now there's a small video that I want to show you. A couple seconds. And this is a video of researchers, scientists, that are investigating a body. And that body was from, I think it's a, a man. And that body was from an ancient Egyptian from the elite. And look what they have found. And listen carefully what he is saying. Well, 
They have just told me that uh, Shemai has a Nubian feature, which means that um, their ruling family was probably Nubian, and th that was unexpected. Examining Shemai's anatomy closely, the thickness of his bone and the shape of his nasal cavity, the anthropologists think he was a black African, likely from neighboring Nubia. A huge revelation that challenges the prevailing image of the Egyptian ruling class. We always thought the ancient Egyptian elites were Mediterranean type. And in this sense, Shema is representing the society of, uh, of the frontier in which different ethnic uh, groups were mixed. At the end, it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Shema was Egyptian. To me, it's always funny when I see those faces that they're very shocked at this revelation. But when you think about it, Egypt is in Africa. Of course, these people were black. And when you think about it, um, many, many different nations came into Egypt. So, of course, it was a melting pot of different nations. But originally, those people in Egypt were black. Because the Bible says Ham is the father of Cush, Egypt, Put and Canaan. And the Bible refers to Egypt as the land of Ham in several Bible verses. Ancient Egyptians didn't call themselves Egyptians because that name was given by victors. Ancient Egypt was called Kemet, and that means black land. And this is also the reason why they chopped off the noses of those pharaohs and the pyramids and the artifacts. Because those relics stand in great opposition when you're trying to rewrite history. So the only solution is to cut off the nose. Because black people, you can recognize them by their nose. It's the truth. This is a very rare picture of these pharaohs, okay, before they cut off the nose. And you, you can see, like, when you look at it, you, you just can see these people are black. As you can see, different nations came into Egypt. But originally, these people were dark-skinned. They were black. When you see the word Mizraim in the Bible, that is the victor's word for Egypt. And Mizraim is the Hebrew and Aramaic name for the land of Egypt and its people. It's ascribed to one of the sons of the biblical figure Ham. And as you can see, Ham is a progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Libyans, and the Canaanites. Now, for this part, I would recommend you to read Jubilees 46, it's the Apocrypha. Jubilees 46, it's a very small chapter. And when you read that chapter, then focus on first 3 till 5, and then open your Bible and read Ezekiel chapter 37, first 1 till 14. But look what it says. So Ham is the forefather of the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Libyans, and Canaanites, but not the Negroes. So we have a difference between Africans and the Negroes. So who are these Negroes? This is a world map of West Africa. And originally it was called Negro land. Okay, that's why Negro is not a bad word. Okay, but they made it as a bad word, but it's not. Originally it was called Negro land. And this world map, you can find it on the webpage of the Library Congress. And it's from 1775. And when you look at that map, okay, and we're going to zoom in. You see, the kingdom of Judah, the house of Judah, was there. Slave coast. Let it sink in. You had grain coast, gold coast, you had the slave coast. And at the slave coast, there was the house of Judah. And as one scholar also said, uh, that part was also called Wida, okay? Known to Europeans by the various names of Fida, Hevida, Wida, Wida. The old writers called it Judah, and its inhabitants were said to be Jews. During the flourishing days of the slave trade, from 16 to 18,000 were annually transported from Ayuda, as the Portuguese called this place, which at that time had a population of 35,000. Now listen, now you have all these black Hebrew camps that are saying that all Africans are Hebrews. It's not. Africans are descendant of Ham. Negroes are descendant of Shem, which means Negroes are the Hebrews. It's not the same. The Africans, the descendant of Ham, even enslaved the Negroes, the children of you-know-who, and even sold them to Arabs and other nations. 
So what the, these black Hebrew cults are saying, it's not true. That's why I told you in my previous video, do not be ignorant about the schemes of the devil. Again, do not be ignorant about the schemes of the devil because the government is also using these camps to scare you off the truth. Why? Because this awakening is happening. The natural branches are waking up. They're waking up. They're realizing who they are. And Satan is fighting against it till this day. He's going to create these camps, these cults to scare you off. So every time when you hear something about Africans being Hebrews, you're going to reject that idea immediately because you have been influenced by the schemes of the devil. You have been being ignorant about the schemes of the devil. I'm going to show you something. This is a book, Geografia di Livio Sanuto. Okay, he made a whole collection of world maps of Africa between 1520 and 1576. And this is the price of the book. $90,000. So now ask yourself the question, why would this book cost so much money? But thank God, there are always people that make, make copies and they will publish it on the internet. And this is a world map in that book. Now look at the map. Now I'm going to zoom in into the center of Africa, which is this part. And it says, Iu deurum terra. I don't know if I pronounced it well, but okay. When you translate that, you're going to have this. That's it, guys. You cannot deny this. You cannot be ignorant about this. This is where it all started, guys. Another world map in the same area, it says Douze Royaumes in French, and it means literally 12 kingdoms, 12 tribes. And those 12 kingdoms are the today's 12 tribes of the biblical, you know who, who left Egypt during the Exodus period and settled in Central and Southern Africa. And these old maps are testifying this. Also, fun fact is that Congo means the belt of truth. But this is where it all started, guys. This is where the natural branches are coming from. Until this day, they are scattered across the whole world. And look, this is not about race. You are talking about race. I am talking about heritage. Because if they have been scattered across the whole world, of course they have probably mixed themselves up. If you have a black person and a white person and they got a child, that child can be black or white. So it doesn't matter. It's not about skin color, okay? The world made it about race and they created racism. If you get triggered and you start, and you start to talk about race, you are talking about race. I am talking about heritage. I am talking about bloodline. And this is the place where that heritage started. This is a database from Amory University from the transatlantic slave trade. Look at the names of these people that were being enslaved. Look at the names. What do you see? Ya, 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 Hanya, 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 Benea, Anya, Tayahu. You see the name of God in their names. They are literally carrying the name of the Lord. And when you look up, for example, Calabar, that is in Nigeria, it's there in Negro land, slave coast. Let this sink in. You cannot deny this. You cannot deny and ignore this evidence. You cannot be ignorant about this because this is the truth. That's why I told you. That's why I told you I will keep blowing trumpets. I will keep blowing trumpets on this because people love to shut down people that are talking about this. And you will come with the most creative arguments in the comment section just to deny this truth because you just can't handle the truth that these people that were being slaves are actually God's people. You just don't love it. You just don't like it. You get triggered about it. 
But this is the truth. If you choose to stay ignorant about this, then it's going to cost you. Because in the book of Romans, okay, in chapter 11, it says, if you are arrogant against the natural branches, okay, God will cut you off for that. God didn't forget about his people. So yes, we are all one in Christ, but there is still a small surviving remnant of the natural branches that God is going to gather. For all these people that are saying you should only preach the gospel because all this stuff doesn't matter. When you say that, you actually show to the world that you don't even understand the gospel. Because Jesus said he is coming for his lost sheep. The gospel and the Bible was written for the Hebrews in the first place. The Messiah is the Jewish Messiah. He came for the Hebrews. He is a Hebrew. And the gospel was preached to the Hebrews first. The reason why the Hebrews could recognize the Messiah was because of his name. He was carrying the name of God in his name. And even that they Hellenized it. But he came for the Hebrews. He came for the lost sheep. And at the day of Pentecost, the disciples, they received the gift of tongues, which means the gift of languages. And then from that day, all other nations could receive the gospel. But until that day, it was first meant for the Hebrews. The Bible was written for the Hebrews. The biblical prophecy depends on the Israelites waking up to who they are. And that is why I'm preaching about this. That is what you need to understand. If you want to be able to discern the hour, if you want to be able to discern the times, if you want to be able to discern the deception, you need to understand that biblical prophecy depends on God's people waking up to who they are. And it does matter. Because of their sufferings, we were able to be grafted in. And now you're saying that all of these things doesn't matter. Where is your fear for the Lord? And that attitude is going to cost you. Conclusion is that the reason why people can never find any evidence of the remains of the biblical characters in so-called Middle East is because they have been looking intentionally in the wrong place. Before 1947, the modern land of you-know-who was Palestine, and before 1885, all of that land was part of Africa. And according to the Book of Jubilees, Northern Africa and the Middle East were Ham's possession. The true promised land is beyond the rivers of Kush from central to southern Africa, and these maps are one of the many evidence supporting the true location of the biblical promised land. And even scientists confirm that the first human being came out of Africa. So again, take this to God. Do not be triggered because of this. Take this to the Lord. Take this to the Lord. The fact that the natural branches are waking up, that means the Messiah is at the door. We are in front of the fall of Babylon, guys. Do you not see the signs? When you are realizing this, then you know that this whole theory of a third temple and uh, the, the sacrifice, the, these blood sacrifices, and there's one man and the Christ and, uh, and this whole peace agreement, it doesn't make any sense because that part is not even the promised land. That is why it matters to preach the truth, to preach about more aspects of the Bible than only the gospel. Something that the Holy Spirit put me in, in my mind was actually uh, the Lion King. The Lion King, okay, Jesus was called the Lion of Judah. Where do lions live in Africa? You know, they will always show something in movies. Uh, they will always push, you know, they will always expose a certain truth because they have to. And this is what, you know, came into my mind. And also the movie 2012 is about the end of the world, you know, the aka destruction of Babylon. And look at the end scene of this movie. Like literally I forgot about this, but it was God that put, that put this into my remembrance. Look at the end scene and look where these people end up to establish a new home after the destruction of the world.
you cannot you cannot you cannot deny this you cannot ignore this you cannot be ignorant about this guys and this is the reason why you need to read the hidden books because in the hidden books you will find all the truth and you will find there's so much more also regarding the latter days the second coming of christ and the lost sheep so what did jesus look like then okay because people will come with different theories but the bible gave us bible first is how we can recognize our messiah daniel chapter 7 verse 9 as i looked Thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. I know only one hair texture that looks like wool, and it even feels like wool. And his feet were burnished bronze. When you go to Google and you type in burnished bronze, this is the color what you're going to have. And oh, some people don't like this, but this is the truth. Our Messiah was a black man, period. And this is how the devil was deceiving the nations through art. As I told you in my previous video, art is a very powerful tool to deceive nations. And this is how they did it. Throughout the time, he just became a white man with blue eyes and long hair. And it's funny because they use Cesare Borgia as the representation of Christ. But let me show you who that guy is. Okay, Leonardo da Vinci was employed by Cesare Borgia, I don't even know if I pronounce his name correctly, but okay, for about a year to work as an engineer, a military architect. And there were rumors that they had a homosexual relationship. Cesare's father, who later became Pope Alexander VI schemed to have the Catholic Church accept his son's image as that of Jesus Christ. Well, look again, the Catholic Church, which is the Harlot Church of Babylon. So people will have problems if you say that Jesus was a black man, but somehow they don't have a problem that a homosexual is representing their Messiah. So think about that. So my message... For all those people that are triggered by this, let's get comfortable being uncomfortable and loving the truth no matter what form it takes. God bless you. Oh, mm -hmm.